times. Yeah. I was about three old, really good-looking guys. Yeah, there we go. And you know, I don't know if you noticed this. Not a lot of pastors do this on a Sunday morning, but somebody brought me one of these from their travels, and it says Habana on it, as in El Cuban. So, yep. So thank you. And anytime you're out traveling this world and sharing the good news and doing those things, don't forget about your pastor. <laughs> well, this morning we're going to talk about, oh, I forgot to change that, so I bet the scripture's wrong too. Yes. Oh, no. Scripture is right. I got it. The name of the sermon is Hard to Believe. Can you believe that I made a mistake? That would be hard to believe. But we got partially right, so... We're going to read the scripture this morning. We are in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 37 through 43. This is one of those little parts of the scriptures that, you know, you kind of read through it just like, and you get done with it, and it's like doesn't really say a lot to you sometimes. But I would encourage you that when you get to those kind of passages where you're reading them and your mind just kind of gets a little fuzzy, it sounds like you've heard it sort of before, stop. And just look at it again, maybe dig a little bit, because there's a lot of times when we approach scriptures that sound or feel a little familiar, but don't have some dynamic, outstanding word, you know, that Jesus puts out there. That sometimes there's truth buried in there that we need to stop and gleam. You know, I love to watch these shows on, I think it's the Discovery Channel, about the gold up in the Yukon, and they're or out in the Bering Sea. And you know, they have picked that ground over and over and over again. But because of new techniques and because of a desire to seek and find, these guys are making fortunes, digging up tiny pieces of gold you can barely see. But it's there, the value is there if you take the time and invest the energy. And I think the same is true about the scriptures. Sometimes we see these passages and we don't think that has a lot to say to us, but There is gold there. So this morning, let's read this passage, starting in verse 37. Even after Jesus had performed so many miracles in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe, because as Isaiah says elsewhere, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. Okay, well, let's pull this apart a little bit and see if we can take something home this morning. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, still they would not believe in him. I think the important word in this passage is believe. And why is believing important? Jesus had been performing miracles and he'd been doing great things. And yet there were people who, even for the evidence put before them, refused to believe that Jesus was who he was claiming to be. They refused to see the signs that pointed all that was behind them towards this one man. All the words of the prophets and all the words and witnesses of the kings and all the words and witnesses of the patriarchs, all were coming true in Jesus. And even he was performing signs and wonders, miracles, and they still yet refused to believe that this was God's Messiah. Believing is so important because it's what changes us. I found this interesting quote about believing. 
written by a Christian, quote, life coach. That's the new cool term for pastor. Okay, so I'm your life coach, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't get that. I'm a pastor. I'm not a life coach. You want a life coach? Pray. Let him coach you. God will coach you. Why is believing important? Well, to believe in something means to trust something without having solid evidence or facts of its truthfulness. This is why a belief is so strong, because it can create whatever reality the belief that are so suits the belief better. So let me read that again because I jumped it a bit. This is why a belief is so strong because it can create whatever reality suits the belief better. It doesn't depend on facts which limit the possibilities of the outer world. Well, break that apart and say what this person is, is saying is that believing is problematic because Sometimes people create mythology with their beliefs. And they base it not on firm evidence or facts. And they can believe in almost anything. I think that that is one of the most incredible tools of the enemy. Get you to believe something because you want to. Get you to believe something because you feel good about it. Get you to believe something because it prospers you or gives you some sort of gain in life. And all of a sudden, what we believe changes in our minds and we do funny things because we believe. I'd like to dispute the statement a little bit. And while I say that part of it's true, there's also a second truth as well. And I would put it this way. To believe in something means to trust something because of the solid evidence and the facts of its truthfulness. Okay, hear that again. Believe in something, to believe in something means to trust something because of the solid evidence and the facts of its truthfulness. Jesus was dealing with a problem in his day. He was trying to get people to see him as God's Messiah so that they would look to him and see eventually in the cross their hope. And through his resurrection, they're being allowed into and become part of a kingdom that was greater, that they would give them eternity in the very presence of God because of the work Jesus was doing. And all it would be required was what? For them to believe in him. For them to believe in him. Now the question then becomes, if we listen to these two different definitions of belief, one can be believing on something that has no facts or merit in truth. The other, I say, Absolutely, you must believe in something, and if it is to be real, it has to be rooted in solid evidence and fact. So when I say I believe in Jesus Christ to be the Lord, the Messiah, my Savior, I do that because I believe that there is solid logical witness and fact behind that statement. But the world wants to get in there and pull that apart and throw things into it. And I believe it's the old kind of mud against, or the, is it mud against the wall? If you throw enough mud against the wall, eventually you got a muddy wall, right? How many of you have done the old spaghetti test? You know, take a strand of spaghetti, throw it up against the wall. You know what that gets you? Wall full of spaghetti and a whole bunch on the floor. We believe in all sorts of funny little myths. And the world comes in and they try to make things look muddy. Was Jesus really a man? Could he possibly ever be God? 
Did he really do miracles? When he healed a demon-possessed person, wasn't that just a mentally ill person, not demonic? And they challenge and they throw all sorts of issues at Jesus and our understanding of him for the purpose of destroying what we know to be truth. There's plenty of evidence of the existence and life of Jesus Christ. I also believe that there is strong evidence and truth found in the behavior and lives of those who knew him and followed him after his death and resurrection. Every one of his disciples, with the exception of Judas, and we know what happened to him, every one of his disciples went out to preach and teach about him. And each one of them was persecuted and all but one, we believe, was put to death. And as C.S. Lewis once said, men do not die for a lie. They do not die to follow a lunatic. That's a paraphrase, but it's simple to understand. If Jesus wasn't who he said he was, if those men who followed him at that time didn't believe in him, they would not have suffered the deaths and lives that they had following that to follow a lie and a lunatic. Clearly stated. So this passage comes up on one of those little quotes from the Old Testament that, you know, sometimes we look at and we read and we kind of like just gloss over, read through it, and get on to the next thing. Who did Isaiah see? I think this is fascinating. In this passage, the writer John says, this was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord who has believed our message, And to whom has the strong arm of the Lord been revealed? He breaks up a couple issues here. First of all, who did Isaiah see? Well, if we go back to the passage that this is actually referenced and go to the full passage, we go to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And it says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, That isn't a small thing. Isaiah is saying he saw the Lord. He has a vision of God. High and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robes filled the temple. Above him were cherubim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty." Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see that this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. This vision that Isaiah gets, if we think of our theology correctly, if we understand and place ourselves mentally correctly, in the right place. The truth we believe in is that we believe in a triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who is eternal from beginning to end, the Alpha and the Omega. So when Isaiah looks upon this throne, who does he see? He sees the Lord in his fullness, his completeness, And somehow in that mystery, he sees Jesus Christ because he is there present as part of the Godhead. 
I believe that Jesus was from the beginning and will be to the end. That this Jesus, whom people are finding hard to believe in, was there from eternity, is here in this moment with Isaiah. And it's only through Christ that forgiveness can be achieved. There's a cause for blindness. For in this passage, it says that they are unable to see. As we pick up in verse 39 from our scripture this morning, for this reason, they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. That particular passage is from the next little section in Isaiah chapter 6. I'd encourage you to go home and read Isaiah. It's probably one of the most beautiful books in the Old Testament. So picking up in verse 8, it goes on and says this in Isaiah chapter 6. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, To whom or whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they may see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. When I think about what this passage is saying, this puts it on us. You might hear it a different way, though. God dulls their hearing. God dulls their eyes so that they can see and not see, hear and not hear. And I think that this is where we have to be mindful and thoughtful about believing. And not only that, but our role in pronouncing. Isaiah is standing in front of God and God asks this question, who will go on our behalf and speak for us? Whom shall I send? God is sending his word into the world through Isaiah. He will bring the world the word through Jesus Christ. God is sending. He has made the truth be known. It's there and it's been repeated throughout the centuries and demonstrated through the person of Christ. God has done that. So it is no fault of God's that people forget to hear or better yet to listen. It is not to blame God because people choose not to see. In fact, in order to sort of have a righteous judgment on this, God sends his prophets, God sent his son, and proclaimed again and again this message that if you turn to me, if you love me, if you follow me, I will hear you. But have you ever preached to deaf ears? I've got three of them in my household. One's 16, one's 10, one's nine. I can tell them life will be so much better for you if you will do X, Y, or Z, right? How many of you in this room had a parent who said the same thing to you and you had to go through and learn the hard way too? You know, your life will be so much better if you pick up your room you'll be able to find that coat that you're missing right now and you're crying about, right? If you do your homework when you get home right away, evening you can sit and watch TV instead of crying and whining because you can't see your favorite show because you've got homework to do, right? If you mow the lawn early on Saturday, you've got the rest of the day to go fishing, We've all been through those lessons. But the reality is, is sometimes parents can say it and say it and say it 
and say it. And what happens to the heart of that child? There are some children that will get it. There is a few. There is hope for our future. But there are also kids that even though their parents have encouraged them and encouraged them and encouraged them, they just have to take the hard road. You, you, you can't do much except continue to love them and pray for them. They just have to learn the hard lesson themselves. And I think that that is a message about the gospel. God has revealed over and over and over and over again his love for his creation, his love for us. And yet we choose to rebel. We choose to ignore the truth. We choose to go our own way. That's why it's important for us to be thinking about learning how to stand strong. A good parent doesn't give up on a child just because they tell them once to pick up their room and they don't do it and they go, well, I guess that's all I can do. Right? You go at the kid again and again and again until hopefully one day the lesson is learned. And God does the same with us. It's why God is still to this day asking this one question. Who shall go for us? The very end of Jesus' life and time with his disciples, he gave them what's called a great commission. Anybody heard of that before? The great commission. Okay, I don't see any hands being raised right now. This is a sad truth. They committed a survey of churches. And they asked, have you ever heard of the Great Commission? 51% of the worshiping church said no. That's surprising. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Teaching them to believe and be baptized and to make disciples. 51% of the church has never heard or been taught or understands the Great Commission. 6% said, well, I'm not sure if I've ever heard that before. 25% said, yes, but I can't recall exactly what it means. And 17% sadly said, yes, and I know what it means. The reason I bring that to you is because I think it's important for us to sometimes stop and remember that we have to put meat on the bone. We have to make rubber hit the road. And when we say we believe something, we better know what the truth is behind it. Because the reality is is that God loves this world. And he's shown this world its love, his love, through his act through Jesus Christ. And it is up to us to go out and preach and teach this good news. The American church is suffering. In fact, the church across the world is suffering in general. Wherever people do not take seriously that great commission where we should be praying for others and teaching them about the truth in Jesus Christ. And we have to be sincere and thoughtful about what we believe. And we have to be honest and accurate with it as well. This last week, a friend of mine put one of those, they call it a meme, M-E-M-E. Is that how you pronounce it? Meme? I always want to say meme you know, but... Meme, I think, is how it's pronounced. And, it, you know, it's a picture, and it has some statement on it. And, uh, you know, he was, it was one of those political things, and he put this on there, and, I mean, it was so disconnected. I know what his point was, but the illustration he was using was so far off base that I wrote back to him and said, you know, 
there's a problem with what you're saying here. And he replied back to me with this. I don't care about the truth. That chilled me to my bones. This is a person who proclaims and professes to be a great truth teller, a strong Christian. And yet in this particular moment over this silly little thing on the internet, I mean, how is this even going to really affect my life? Like, not. And yet he doesn't care about the truth. And I thought, that is sad. Because if you don't care about the truth and you allow the world to come in and refocus you, mold you into the way it behaves, then we don't have a solid grip on who God is and what he does in our lives. And then everything just becomes up for grabs. That's why our lives matter. And when Jesus and God tells us to go into all the world and proclaim the truth, teach the gospel, make disciples, it's based on us doing it in a way that shows integrity. If you cheat on your taxes, your accountant will know whether you're a Christian or not. If you show up at church all looking great and everything and your family's afraid of you because you're a bully at home, your children will know whether you're a true Christian or not. If you go to work and your lips talk about women in a degrading way or you use language that's over the top, your coworkers will know whether or not God is real in your life. The truth is has to change us. We don't change the truth. The truth has to change us. We cannot change the truth. So this morning, I want to encourage you, when you read little passages of the scriptures like this, you have to dig deep. Listen to the last part of this passage. Verse 41, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Remember, he saw the throne of God. Yet at the same time, many even amongst the leaders believed in him. So we're back in the current moment with Jesus having performed all these miracles. There are those who do not believe him because they do not want to accept the truth behind the miracles. Yet there are others who do. But it adds this caveat. Yet because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than the praise of God. If you love being right more than what you're doing to your children's hearts, you aren't doing the right thing. If you like looking like a tough guy in front of the rest of the guys at work and you aren't changing the world by the way you talk and live, if you're not sharing the gospel and going out and living the Great Commission, you're missing it. And let me say it this way. I've done every one of those stupid things. And I want to show you the grace in this passage very quickly. These these words were spoken about people who would later go on and sacrifice their lives, I believe, for Jesus Christ. Peter stood outside one day and he denied Christ three times. You know him. No, I don't. You were with him. No, I wasn't. You're one of his guys. No, I'm not. Yet Peter grew to become one of the strongest witnesses and changed the world. We may not always do it right, and we may need time, but God's grace, love, and mercy, if we will stick to the truth, will bring us through in the end. And who we were when we were 25, 
and who we were when we were 35 and who we are when we are 65 and or 85 is going to be very different. The question is, are we growing in grace and truth and are we believing in the one whom God has sent? Be strong, even in your moments of weakness. Be filled with grace and let the truth speak for itself and go out and share this good news with someone else. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, thank you for your love for us, and thank you for your love for your church. Lord, help us to learn more about you in each and every day. Help us to discover you and the truth about you, and not to let the world paint its mud onto that picture, but Lord, help us to be people strong in our faith, convinced of what we believe, and believe in the truth that you've shown to us so that we can go out and share it with a world that so desperately needs to hear it. Help us to be strong in our faith and our convictions, gracious in our words and our acts of kindness and love that might show others the good news and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Take us from this place, Father, in your strong word and encourage us with your grace and your love. In these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen.